hope I will be meeting with Kim Jong-un would be a tremendous thing for North Korea and a tremendous thing for the world. The Department of Homeland Security has released the gang members that were shielded from deportation gang because members. of sanctuary policies. I think Fox News exploits this issue. We have criminals that do horrible things all the time. What do you want to say to Jerry Brown about his sanctuary state? Every person who's, who's died is your fault. What do you do? If your grandchild or your daughter's child, what would you do, Jerry Brown? A nightmare at 30,000 feet. A south West jet, the engine blew mid-flight. Now we're learning more about the other passengers who jumped into action to try to save that woman's life. I was almost relieved to have something to do. I know how to do CPR. I can help. Do you remember when Brian and Steve bet that the president wouldn't hit the links with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe? It's time for Brian to pay up. I'm gonna pay. There you go. Thank Five you. bucks. Here you go. That's Bob Seger singing Ramblin' Man. Gambling Man. Ramblin man. You know, no, Ramblin' from, Gamblin' Man. From time to time, we we all make little bets. Right. And a couple of days ago, the yeah. bet was when Shinzo Abe went to see Donald Trump down in Mar-a-Lago, would they play golf? Brian, uh, his uh, inside sources said no, they would not play golf. And then pretty much everybody else in America Brian, said, are you kidding? Brian's inside source is his inside voice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he just right. said, yes. I'm uh, going to say whatever, Steve. I'm going to disagree with Steve. No, no, I really felt as though they were going there just to summit, just to talk. Right. And, and a then, golf course. Right, but yeah, that's true. Don't so, most negotiations happen on the golf course? Some people do, but if you're not good at golf, you don't do anything there. But here's the thing. So I thought they, they, they golfed already together. They can golf on their own. They have so much to do. Right. How are they possibly going to try? Plus, the president golfed in the rain on Sunday. He loves well, he's to golf. Probably, but he's probably sick of the sun. You, you're sick making of the golfing. argument. The guy will golf in the rain. So rather than, look, the, the summit wasn't at the State Department. So it I was lost. at a golf course. Brian lost his bet. Uh, uh, Five dollars to pretty much everybody in the studio. Why Dana, Steen, in front of ten. You. you gave the money away, and now you have it back. Yeah, well, a lot of people have decided that they shouldn't. That we shouldn't bet on television. <laughs> I mean, they already want us to do the uh, the poll. Now, who's on the ten? Uh, it's uh, who's on the ten? I give this to Janice. No, I know, but who's that guy? Didn't you write a book about that guy? Oh, Thomas Jefferson, Tripoli Pirates, available now. Brian, okay. All right. <laughs> Meanwhile, let's talk a little bit about this. Something else that the president did talk about in that joint appearance yesterday with Shinzo Abe was a little bit about the upcoming summit with North Korean leader, dictator Kim Jong-un. It sounds like it's going to happen uh, either at the end of May or early in June. Apparently the venue is right now one of the main sticking points. Out, they will not have it in Washington, Beijing, Seoul, or Pyongyang. It sounds like there's a possibility it could be Singapore, Switzerland, or Sweden. This uh, is what the president said about that meeting. I will be meeting with Kim Jong-un in the coming weeks to discuss the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Hopefully that meeting will be a great success and we're looking forward to it. It would be a tremendous thing for North Korea and a tremendous thing for the world. We've never been in a position like this with that regime. If I think that it's a meeting that is not going to be fruitful, we're not going to go. If the meeting when I'm there is not fruitful, I will respectfully leave the meeting. It's so smart uh, to come out and say, listen, I'm not promising you the moon. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we're at, the, you know, we're at the goal line. I'm telling you that there was enough there when I sent my CIA director, soon to be Secretary of State, uh, over there. He saw enough promise to go ahead with it because, you know, the key to these summits is, is plowing the ground so you don't go in there blind. I think this, in this way, I think this is going to be the situation. They go in there with certain marks to hit. But after he leaves, there's going to be a lot of negotiation after he's done. Rather than leaving with an agreement, I think they're going to leave with a framework to move forward on talks. 
Meanwhile, at the same time, no more nuclear tests. Mm -hmm. Maybe we subside on the war exercises. We have 38,000 troops. Maybe we pull 3,000 back. Uh, symbol, uh, See, I think they're going. I think they're going to wind up with a deal. I mean, you look at the news so right he, now. He's going to leave with a deal. Yeah, absolutely. That's why you have somebody uh, at another level go and to set the table, so that you show up, yeah. you wind up with a big deal. We, we don't know if that's going to happen. And, and now with Mike Pompeo, while he's been a great CIA director, who by the way was approved by the Senate 66 to 32, Ainsley, it looks like it's tough sledding for Mr. Pompeo in the Senate this time. Now that he wants to be our chief. Well, you diplomat. need the Republicans on board, Rand Paul said he did say he wasn't going to support Mike Pompeo becoming Secretary of State. But the president says he thinks that he'll come around. He thinks he'll be a yes vote. He needs that yes vote. Um, Senator Cory Gardner says there is no good reason to vote against Mike Pompeo. Listen to this. I think the Senate historian has said, going back to at least 1925, this has never happened for a Secretary of State nominee. It's happened in other nominations, but you don't want this to happen. That's clear. There really is no good reason to vote against Mike Pompeo. I think we can work with Rand Paul. I hope that, uh, that those conversations continue to gain his support. But there really is no reason uh, by the Democrats who voted for Mike Pompeo to be CIA director uh, to oppose his nomination for a Secretary of State other than blind and absurd partisanship. You know, they'll like kind of look in and say, well, how is President Trump going to treat a Secretary of State, and how is it going to affect the State Department? Well, Rex Tillerson went in there and wrecked the place. We don't know what he exactly was doing, but the morale was in the toilet, and there was nobody rehired, and a lot of people resigned. Maybe some of that had to be done, but there was no sign that he was going to reconcile the State right. Department and his image. However, this Secretary of State has the President's ear and understands he's got to rebuild the State Department, so the State Department will have great street cred right. with the President, which I assume is the right. goal. The other thing is Marco Rubio, who was kind of a against Tillerson, just tweeted out, uh, uh, with Iran threatening China, Russia, and North Korea, the U.S. national security now is not the time to play politics so and block Pompeo. Right. Do the mature thing, not the partisan thing, right. for the first time in years. Well, but the Senate liked the fact that Rex Tillerson was not on the same page all the time with the president. So uh, Democrats felt he would be the counterbalance. The, not know, during good, the nomination good process. Cop, good cop, bad cop. They weren't always on the same page. But now, because Mike Pompeo and the president are simpatico on everything, uh, that's why so many Democrats say, mm, I don't know if we want a yes man as the secretary of state. It's not he, cer he certainly is not a yes man. His Historically, though, Hillary Clinton, when she was up for nomination, only two no votes. When John Kerry was up for nomination, only three no votes. For every Democrat to say no, that would be No matter crazy. what the president wants. The swamp or the Democrats want to say absolutely right. not, if even it when to it be, comes to something, our country's safety. Yeah, if it has absolutely. to go to the floor, uh, if it has to go to the floor, it's an embarrassment. First time in decades that would be the case. And if it does go to the floor, no guaranteed of passage if Democrats don't flip. And guess who benefits? Guess who's thinking only about November? In this case, the Democrats. Because Always. they know they can embarrass this president, who, by the way, has a CIA director to get confirmed, could be tougher. And by the way, has a VA secretary to get confirmed, could be even tougher than that. Meanwhile, the President of the United States was asked, of course, before he left, about the Mueller investigation with the Japanese leader right there. Here's what he said to make it clear. He's not firing anybody and never was. There was no collusion with Russia other than by the Democrats. This was a uh, really a hoax created largely by the Democrats as a way of uh, softening the blow of a loss. You look at the fact that their server the DNC server was never gotten by the FBI. Why did the FBI take it? The FBI takes what they want. They go in, they wouldn't get the server. As far as the investigation, nobody has ever been more transparent than I have instructed our lawyers. Be totally transparent. Uh, as far as uh, the two gentlemen you told me about, uh, they've been saying I'm going to get rid of them for the last three months, four months, five months. And uh, they're still here. Well, we had David Bossi on the curvy couch earlier. He's the one that wrote the book with Corey Lewandowski called Let Trump Be Trump. Many people want him to stop tweeting. They're saying he was elected because he is the man he is. Let him be Trump. David Bossi also said that Democrats, they would love for the president to fire Mueller so they'd have something against him. And that's why they're loving this, this Russia uh, lead and rest in Russia investigation. Listen to this. The American people see what's going on. The world is in a dangerous place. 
And I'm sick and tired of the Democrat Party using our foreign policy with the Russians as a political lever. And that's what they've done. That's all they have. They have no agenda for America or for the American people. They don't have a, a solution to our economy, our national security problems. They only want to attack this president who has done an incredible job. And one of their biggest fears is what happened yesterday. A president acting like a president, getting the respect of another world leader, going ahead, making historic achievements in North Korea to get us to this point. And that's when you see the press move against them. They've got to come up with something to get people's attention off a legitimate policy. Instead of debating a policy or procedure, they right. want to they want to pull it into not ready. Not worthy. What if he has this meeting with Kim Jong Un and he gets, gets rid of the deal. nuclear weapons? How do you think the press will handle that? Yeah, uh, They'll still be against him, right? Yeah, it would be very <laughs> tough to go to, to get right? around that. Listen, the press doesn't like the president. I'm just getting the feeling. Yeah, that's the trust your trust your instincts. <laughs> All right, eight ten here in New York City, and uh, Jillian, you've got a Fox News alert. That's right. Let's go ahead and get you caught up on this story that we're following. A man accused of recruiting 9-11 terrorists for al-Qaeda is reportedly behind bars. Kurdish forces in Syria say they are interrogating Mohammed Zamar. He was arrested in Morocco after the terror attacks in an operation involving CIA agents and handed over to Syria authorities, but was released when war broke out in the country back in 2014. The Pentagon hasn't yet confirmed his capture. Just one day after that nightmare explosion on a southwest plane, the engine of a Delta jet catches fire. Check it out. Thick black smoke coming out from under the wing, forcing the plane, which was heading from Atlanta to London, to turn back. The issue with the uh, engine on the right-hand side, uh, apparently there's some smoke coming from it. Firefighters sprang the plane down with foam on the tarmac. Thankfully, no one was hurt. Passengers were put on another flight. The cause of that fire is under investigation. It's the end of an era for the first time in the lives of many Cubans. Someone other than a Castro brother is taking over leadership of the communist nation. Raul now stepping down as the country's president, a position the 86-year-old has held since his late brother Fidel's resignation back in 2008. Raul has been preparing his vice president, 57-year-old Miguel Diaz as Canal to take his place. Castro intends to remain as head of the Communist Party. NASA launching a satellite to find new planets. Three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. Ah, the spacecraft Tess hitching a ride to outer space on the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Cape Canaveral in Florida. It will scan the skies for at least two years, searching for planets outside of our solar system. What do you guys think? Do they exist? That's really cool. Uh, did they launch another car this time? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. That's probably next. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Julian. All right, uh, straight ahead, California Governor Jim Brown slamming President Trump over the illegal immigration debate. It's just an inflammatory football uh, that very uh, uh, low-life politicians like to exploit. The mm. acting deputy commissioner for Customs and Border Protection, Rod Vitello, is going to join Brian next. Not a low-life. Plus, James Comey's latest claim, he's not political. Really? I don't care whether people support a Republican or a Democrat, because I'm not either. I don't care who they support. All right, California Governor Jerry Brown continuing his crusade against President Trump over illegal immigration, kind of. It's very important that they be integrated in a humane, intelligent way. But instead, it's just an inflammatory football uh, that very uh, uh, low-life politicians like to exploit. And I think it's shocking. It's um, despicable. And he's trying to weave in illegal immigrants in a nice, humane way. Really? Brown has agreed, though, to mobilize 400 National Guard troops, but not to enforce immigration laws. Here to react is acting deputy U.S. Customs Border Protection uh, Commissioner Ron Vitello. Ron, are you okay with the limitations on the 400 National Guards members? We, we've asked for a certain level of missions from all of the border states. We're grateful that the governors have agreed to deploy on the southwest border. And the, the restrictions in California are not that different than what we're asking the Guard to do. Uh, looking for aviation support. We're looking to have them help uh, watch sensor feeds and cameras for us. Uh, road maintenance, brush clearing, those are the kind of things that will help us do the mission better. And then 
replace where Border Patrol agents may be doing some of those functions, those agents will then be deployed to the border. So they're not going to guard people taken into custody. They're not going to arrest people for alleged immigration violations or support immigration law enforcement activities. And you're okay with that? That's right. We've never, we're not going to ask them to do law enforcement duties, and that's the, the, the rules set we put together with the Pentagon. So we're st stunned to see the sanctuary state and all these uh, cities rising up saying, that's not okay with me. They're beginning to sue the government uh, of California to get rid of that status. What is the problem with sanctuary state status when it comes to border enforcement? It encourages people to go to places where they think they might be safe. This is not, no jurisdiction should be put in a place where they're protecting people who have broken the law uh, and that law crossing the border illegally. It's, it's not safe for the communities that those people live in. It's not safe for our law enforcement officers. I'm very good friends with the director at ICE, Tom Holman, and he will tell you that his officers are in more danger when they have to look for fugitives in communities or in homes. It's, it's against it, it's contrary to their officer safety, and it's not right. good for the communities either. And Ron, it's just, it's just logic. It's harder to find somebody than it is to pick somebody up who's waiting for you after they were apprehended by local officials. So I was staggered to see this map. How many ISIS, excuse me, MS-13 members have been released back into society after they came to this country? Two-thirds of them are from California, 89 in all, 53 to the rest of the country. How do we change that? Yeah, this isn't good. No jurisdiction should be protecting people who are in the country illegally, especially when they're in the jail setting. And when they're in the jail setting, all they have to do is get a hold of ICE, and ICE will be happy to come and pick those people up and deport them. That would be great. But the other thing is, we got there's a lot of controversy in politics being played on the border wall. Where do you stand, Ron? I, I stand on meeting the president's requirement, meeting the public's demand for border security. So we put plans in place to, to deploy border wall in the places where we most need it, uh, to fix dilapidated fencing that's out there and change it into the border wall. And so we're going to continue to do that to the extent we have funding. And, and the other things that the president asked for, especially closing these loopholes and ending catch and release. We do all of those things. We can start to meet the demand the public has that we have for ourselves to secure that border. And because it's springtime and here they come, right? Uh, Ron Vidiello, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. All right, uh, 10 minutes before the bottom of the hour. We're learning more about the passengers who tried to save a woman's life after a Southwest plane engine blew up mid-flight. Coming up, you'll hear from a nurse who performed CPR for more than 20 minutes. Plus, it is 824 in Capitol Hill. Now some headlines from that spot. The push for a Dreamer immigration bill gaining steam in the U.S. House of Representatives. A bipartisan majority asking Speaker Paul Ryan to schedule a debate on proposals to replace DACA. The bill, considered most popular, would protect Dreamers from deportation and include some border security. It does not include building that border wall. Meanwhile, Newborn babies are now allowed on the floor of the U.S. Senate. The new rule inspired by Illinois Democrat and new mom Tammy Duckworth. Her daughter, Miley Pearl, born earlier this month. Dirk Duckworth is the only sitting senator to give birth in American history. So, seems appropriate. She should be able to take the baby to work. All right, Ainsley, over Thank to you. Thank you, Steve. President Trump's Faith Advisory Council speaking out following an invite-only meeting at Wheaton College involving roughly 50 faith leaders. Reports say the meeting was very anti-Trump and discussed the future of the evangelical movement in light of the Trump presidency. Here with Insight, co-hosts of the Christian Broadcast Network's Faith Nation, Jenna Browder and David Brody. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Great to be with you. Good morning, Thank you. Well, Jenna, we'll start with you. Tell us the story here. What happened? Right. This was supposed to be a meeting, Ainsley, about evangelism and about faith. But from what we understand, it really turned quickly into a Trump bashing. Sources close to the meeting, with knowledge of it, saying that, uh, you know, they, they really didn't realize, some of these people, what they were getting into. And in fact, a few people actually walked out of the meeting. That's right. And Ainsley, I will say that it was one-sided venting here is what happened. This is a two-day conference. The first side became basically this free-for-all, uh, this anti Donald Trump free for all. It got so many folks ticked off, as Jenna was saying, people walked out. And so, and I think that that's important to understand that after day one, they left 
And then day two continued on, but they were gone. If you look at the polls, uh, evangelicals voted for him, voted for President Trump at a record level. And the latest uh, Pew poll research shows that his approval rating among evangelicals is 78 percent. He won with 81 percent. So he hasn't lost a lot of the evangelicals. What do you think, David, his greatest legacy is? Is it the conservative judicial appointments that he's made? Well, I think that's huge. Uh, and remember, we go back to the campaign, 20 or so, that he actually said he would actually point uh, from that list, Supreme Court nominations or Supreme Court nominees from that list. So that's going to be a huge part of his legacy. I will say the other part has got to be Israel. I mean, look, uh, he has talked about it, and it's true. President after president talked about Jerusalem being the capital of Israel, but never moved the embassy there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then here along comes Donald Trump and actually does it. And that's what evangelicals love about him, that he, he actually says... Uh, he does what he says. Yeah, promises made, promises kept. So were these just establishment pastors? Were they part of the establishment or, or never, never Trumpers? Yeah, from what we understand, a lot of them were more uh, moderate in their uh, beliefs mm -hmm. when it relates to uh, public policy. And, and they do lean Anyone a little famous bit more that we would have known about that's, that went to that meeting? Well, there were, a you know, for, you know, Tim Keller, obviously in New York, a big mega pastor. Yeah, now he hasn't church. typically, yeah, he hasn't mm -hmm. typically been involved in politics. So, you know, it's hard to kind of classify all of them a certain way. I, I will just say this: that you know, you've got the Washington Post and some other outlets talking about this big evangelical meeting. Look, the truth of the matter is, this is a meeting with a bunch of evangelicals okay. that really have no say within the Trump administration. And so, and the fact that he had no uh, Trump advisory group members there. I mean, I think that speaks right, volumes. Real quickly, what's going to happen to this pastor that's held in Turkey? He's accused of terrorism, aiding an Islamic, Islamist movement, and spying. Do they have any evidence? And his trial is on May 7th. What do you think will happen? Hmm. It's going to be tough. Uh, you know, I, I will say this, that, you know, Erdogan in Turkey for a long time is trying to go from a secular viewpoint uh, right into that Islam, Islamic viewpoint. As a matter of fact, he talks about this army of Islam that he wants to rise up against Israel. There's reports about that. So this has been a nasty, nasty turn in Turkey uh, and some real issues for the United States. And I think President Trump is going to be involved in this as well. Yeah, yeah. Of course, he was tweeting about it. And the president's attorney, Jay Sekulow, he is a, a leading attorney when it comes to religious freedom. He's also closely linked to this. So with both of those forces behind behind him, I think that'll really yeah. help. Not going away. If you ask Americans, they say he's just on trial for his Christian beliefs. Thank right. you so for much sure. for being here. We appreciate it. God bless Thank you. Thanks, Emily. The Thank city of Houston preparing to celebrate the life of Barbara Bush as tributes pour in from across the country. We are live in Houston next. And Planned Parenthood gets nearly half a billion dollars from taxpayers every year. And now they want to spend $30 million dollars on the Democrats during the midterms. Dana Lash says the public is being robbed. Taxpayer dollars, she says. She's on deck next. A live look at Houston City Hall, where people will soon be gathering to celebrate the life of the former First Lady Barbara Bush. This, as we learned, the Obamas, the Clintons, and First Lady Melania Trump will attend the funeral. That'll be Saturday. Meanwhile, our correspondent Adam Housley is live outside the funeral home there in Houston, where in the last hour the sun has come up. Adam, good morning. Good morning, guys. Yeah, the sun has come up here. Quite the guest list, that's for sure. You know, the memorials have really been ongoing since Tuesday evening when she passed away here in Houston. In fact, we can go back to that look at the City Hall of Houston. It lit up blue last night, but throughout the day there are flowers being placed there. There's a portrait of the former First Lady there as well. Uh, we're told that location and a couple of others around the city, uh, flowers continue to be brought by those who are paying their respects to her. Uh, really a beautiful tribute tonight. There also will be a candlelight vigil at the City Hall. Uh, from there to the church, St. Martin's Episcopal, Church is just down the street from where we are here, also near the Bush home where she passed away Tuesday evening. That's where she'll lie in repose tomorrow and where the services will take place on Saturday before she'll eventually be taking to College Station, Texas, about an hour and a half away for burial. Um, and we're still hearing more remembrances from her family, George W. Bush, with this humorous, and there's a lot of those humorous stories, remembrance of his mother. Take a listen. The day before she died, I said, Mom, I just want you to know you've been a fabulous mother and I love you dearly. And she said, I want you to know that you're my favorite son on the phone. <laughs> You can't help but laugh, guys, when you hear some of these remembrances from her. And so many people around town here do as well. She was, of course, well-loved here across the country, but so much so here in Texas where the family, of course, spent so much of their time. Back to you guys in, in New York. They did indeed. In fact, uh, she lived not too far from where Adam is standing right there. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Adam. All right. Uh, let's go down to Texas as well. Dana Lash is a uh, radio talk show host and NRA spokesperson, and she joins us live. Good morning to you, Dana. Good morning. 
Good morning to you all. So there's a story out uh, this morning that uh, apparently San Diego County has joined the lawsuit against the sanctuary state of California, uh, joining the Department of Justice lawsuit as well. Uh, are we reaching a critical mass? Because slowly but surely, so many localities and now counties in Southern California are saying, hey, Sacramento, Jerry Brown, just stop it. Now you're absolutely right, Steve. Thanks for having me this morning. You know, speaking for myself on this, and look at California, I know Los Alamitos was one of the, the first cities to push back against California's sanctuary state. They said that these are these are laws that are completely disregarding the Constitution. And there are a number of Californians that are tired of the lawlessness. And and it's they're tired of seeing the lawlessness paraded around by those members of the political class in whom they invested their authority to carry out the law. And they're also tired of being worried in their own Communities. I mean, there was a the DOJ actually, or DHS, sorry, came out with a, a report saying that what was it? One third of about 150 MS-13 gang members that had been in custody were released in California. Mm -hmm. California is protecting the criminal element at the expense of citizens' safety, and California residents have had enough. I think it was two thirds were from California. But what about the governor? The governor is saying that Fox News is exploiting this issue. We interviewed, we've interviewed so many parents that have lost their kids. By, by criminal illegal aliens that continue to get back in our country or they were never, they were never detained by ICE or never sent back to their countries. Yeah, I would love for the governor to look at Kate Steinle's family and tell them that, it, that, that anyone but California is exploiting this issue. Or say the same thing to Jamil Shaw Sr., whose son would be alive today if perhaps California government had done their job. Uh, I think that's kind of a disgraceful remark for the governor of California to make because it's his own lawlessness that has, that has perpetuated, that's pushed this problem, not Fox News. I mean, blaming Fox News for your, your, your refusal to uphold the Constitution and your refusal to work with ICE and make sure that your citizens are safe. That's a dereliction of duty. That's not media malpractice. Yeah, I mean, you got a choice. Uh, what's more important, American citizens or the world citizens? You were elected for American citizens, and that's really, the, uh, that's really where the rubber hits the road. There's another story out there as we get closer to the midterm elections. Believe it or not, we got still got months. The Planned Parenthood has an ungodly amount of money going to the Dems for the midterms. $30 million, and yet they're still being subsidized with taxpayer dollars. Does that seem legitimate? No, it's... Um it's appalling. I mean, I, and, and I, I've said this before, and I've talked about this on, on my program, and I, I've, I've it just, it's infuriating to me to see so many taxpayers robbed. And that's what it is. This is, you have innocent American taxpayers who are being robbed to pay an organization that in turn spends our money on Democrat campaigns. We as Americans are being forced to, to fund Democrat campaigns, because that's who Planned Parenthood funds. Fought to the tune of half a billion dollars a year, this is happening happening. And this is a for-profit business. And if they can afford to spend millions and millions of dollars on all of these Democrat politicians and to pay for and buy influence in Washington, D.C., well, then they can, they can very much afford to operate without uh, the indulgence of society's forced tax funding. And mm -hmm. that's what this is. I mean, it's appalling. And this was one of the things that I was um, in this omnibus that I wish had not been continued because we had a chance to not right. continue to fleece taxpayers to support Democrats. I and I'm glad you mentioned that at the end because ultimately, I mean, if Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell didn't want it there, they got pens. They could have scratched it out. But no, it went right through. So blame the Republicans. Yeah, it did go right through. It, it, yeah, under Republicans, which is appalling. I mean, and Republicans, they, I mean, they, they pretended to hear what voters were saying about wanting to keep more of their own money and about limited government. This isn't the way to do it, to, to rob the people that voted for them to pay for their opponents. I mean, they're financing their, their opposition. Right. They're financing Hillary Clinton. $38 million was spent by Planned Parenthood on Hillary Clinton. We paid for it. They said that they did it so uh, they got fully funded Defense Department, but it shouldn't have been that trade-off. Meanwhile, James Comey's doing his uh, right. endless media tour, and I think it's beginning to blow up on him. He's getting even tougher questions now, and he seems to have no answers. Talking about politics, listen. Well, you sound like a political commentator to me. More yeah, than I don't mean to director. be. I, I, I don't care whether people support a Republican or a Democrat, because I'm not either. I don't care who they support. I hope the conversation will start with values and come to policy second, because we're always going to fight about guns and taxes and immigration. But all we are as this country is a collection of values, and that's what unites Republicans and Democrats. Political statement. Hmm. 
What's your reaction, Dana? Yeah, Ainsley, you can't you can't pretend to lecture Americans from this this ivory pedestal about values and virtue while simultaneously making snarky remarks about the size of the president's hands and the circles under his eyes. He stepped all over the message of his own book because he he wrote it like he's Regina George writing the burn book. That's what he that's what James Comey sounds like. I have never seen a cattier man than James Comey. And so he gets in his own way. He tries to portray himself as this virtuous example that all of ever, everyone in Washington should follow, but he gets in his own way because his book is so petty. No one's paying attention to anything else in his book. They're all talking about how petty he is. And, I, you know, he knows better than that. I just think he is. He wanted to. He has the a spine of jelly. He was able to be influenced by public opinion and politics. He was able to be influenced by Loretta Lynch. He was a bad FBI director, yeah. and he tried to because of his bad leadership. He attempted to, to stain all of the really good FBI agents that are under him. Yep, and now he's attempting to sell as many books as possible during this book tour. If he'd like to stop by our show, we'd love to have him, but I don't think, uh, you know, he's going to just very I'd love to watch him places. on your show. I know, I know. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Comey, if you're watching, call us. Come on. All right. All right. Dana, nice Thanks, to see Dana. you. Thank you. All right, Jillian has some headlines for us. That's right. Good morning to you guys. Let's get you caught up on this uh, scary story that we've been following. The engine that caused a deadly explosion on a southwest plane takes off every two seconds. More than 2,400 planes with that specific engine are in the air at any given time. And we are hearing for the first time from the plane's heroic pilot. You see her right there, Tammy Jo Schultz, releasing a statement saying, quote, We all feel we were simply doing our jobs. Schultz also mourning the loss of passenger Jennifer Reardon saying, quote, our hearts are heavy. We all reflect on one family's profound loss. Peggy Phillips, the retired school nurse who, nurse who tried to save Reardon's life, joined us earlier. She says she didn't think twice before jumping in to help. It's just part of who we are, and you're always going to be ready to step in and lend assistance. I was almost relieved to have something to do that would that I knew I was in control of. I know how to do CPR. I can help. Phillips says passengers stayed calm during that horrific event. A good magician never shares his secrets, right? But famous Las Vegas showman David Copperfield is being forced to. Copperfield revealing his signature Lucky 13 disappearing act in court after being sued by an audience member. Gavin Cox claims he was hurt participating in the trick when he tripped and fell rushing to the stage through a dark construction area with no guidance. Let's look at your headlines. Back to you. How much does he want? Any idea? That I don't know. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jillian. All right. Straight ahead, Democrat Steny Hoyer says his party will raise taxes if they take back control of Congress in the midterms. Is that really a winning message? Bob Massey says no. He'll explain next. Some Democrats say they are eyeing ways to roll back President Trump's tax cuts if the Democrats win the House in the midterm elections. Watch. Is that raising the tax rate back again on the highest income earners? I think, on, I think certainly we'll look to have revenues as opposed to simply creating more debt. We'll look for more revenue rather than debt. So what would that mean for you? Join us right now is uh, for the Massey Memo. Host of The Property Man, Fox News legal analyst Bob Massey joins us from, as you can see, yes, behind him in Las Vegas. Bob, I, I think this could be a dumb strategy. If the Democrats' mantra well, I mean, going into, into the uh, 20, uh, 2018 midterms is going to be, hey, vote for us, we're going to raise your taxes, that's a no-brainer. Yeah, I mean, I was very surprised to hear a lot of the comments that he meant, which we'll talk about. But obviously, when you hear these type of statements, I'm not really sure why he would make those statements, except, like you said, it's a pretty silly and stupid strategy. The bottom line on all this is the fact that when I hear these statements mm -hmm. and I hear them start talking about debt... I mean, how much debt was created in eight years under the former administration? Right. So when the Democrats keep talking about this, it's just so ridiculous. But they put it out there because, honestly, Steve, my biggest concern on midterms is people forget about things. And that's my biggest concern, that their message, the Republicans have to have a really good message to get these midterms in the right order. Well, right, you know, the message right now is Democrats are going to raise your taxes. And the Republicans can say, look, we cut your taxes. There's another standard. Stand Hoyer soundbite we want to play. Bob, listen to this. Yes. First of all, we want to invest in growing jobs. Uh, we talk about infrastructure. That's one way uh, to do it. We talk about jobs skills for the 21st century. That's another way to do it. 
Okay, well, that sounds good. Everybody wants to grow jobs. Well, if you take him off the picture and put it back in, that's exactly what President Trump has been doing mm -hmm. and saying. He wants infrastructure. Congress has to approve that in order for him to get the infrastructure. The president's wanted to create jobs, which in fact he has. The president talks about increasing job skills. So when I hear that, I'm saying, is he really Republican as opposed to Democrat? Because this is exactly the message that President Trump has been saying before the election right. and during his term. Well, obviously, the Democrats have to change their messaging because uh, for a while, Nancy Pelosi and company were saying, oh, you know, those little tax cuts, they're just crumbs. Well, I have to tell you, I, I represent not a lot of big businesses in Vegas, but a couple, and they have grown. Uh, they're yeah. very excited about the tax cuts. So, I mean, and when you look at it nationally, the things that Fox and Friends have covered, the CEOs you've had on, what they're saying is just not true. The, the country is growing. The country is active. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of optimism. And as a result of that, what has been done right. is very good. And people forget, Nancy Pelosi, you give somebody a thousand dollars. Yeah, that's a lot of money for people that are paycheck to paycheck people. Absolutely. The problem is they forget about what a thousand dollar means. No kidding. All right. Uh, Bob Massey, great words of wisdom from Vegas. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. 11 minutes now before the top of the hour. Did you notice some noise during that segment? Well, Melissa Francis and her kids arrived in the studio. They started dropping stuff. They're going to be cooking next. Good job. Was it me? We're going to start spicing. Yeah, Meanwhile, Bill Hemmer has never made noise in the background no, as his co-host is speaking. Uh, see, that's a five-second rule, so let them know they can eat it, okay? <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. High stakes with the president saying about North Korea today. Also, from the Hill, Republicans level a threat against the Justice Department. What they want to see and soon. And an American pastor.